I didn't see putting a relationship first. I didn't see affection. I, I didn't see any of those things. But then you see the superficial, you know, fairy tale stuff in your Disney and in your shows and your movies. So then you're like, I want that. And part of even the deep desire for that is because you lack the truth over here. Welcome to the Godbolt Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Godbolt, with my beautiful wife, Jade Godbolt. We believe that marriage God's way is the most powerful catalyst towards healing and holiness for you and everybody after you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Happy whatever the day is for you that you are watching this or listening to this. So we were waiting for everything to get set up and I was talking to one of the owners of the space and they just got engaged and it started with just talking about working with your significant other, doing business with them and how, you know, we wouldn't want it any other way and how it's it's actually easier to do so. Like there's trust there, there's, there's relationship, which is where the conversation took a really good detour on talking about the importance of relationship and they started to talk about how she was and how they both grew up differently and how in his home it was like you know my way or the highway there wasn't really relationship there was more so like this ranking order and if you stepped outside of that ranking order then you would get reprimanded so it it teaches you and i came from a very similar background where it teaches you like well once you get into a place of authority then it's my way of the highway. So that authority is actually removing your choice, which is to remove love. So it's just, it is what it is. And you just deal with it. And then you just wait until I can't wait to get my own. <laughs> so then I can be the authoritative and I can make the decisions and all of those things, which works for you until you get with someone else. As long as you're by yourself, that works. Then enter the woman that God created you for and for you, that's not going to fly and it shouldn't fly. We've talked you know, plenty of times about how both of our roles, both of our dominion is very necessary. There's things that my wife can't do that I can do and there's things that I can do that she can't do. Those two become one when married for a reason. So how they got to the point that they got to now was they would fight. And they would go, you know, toe to toe and he wasn't backing down, except, well, she didn't grow up that way. She grew up with her parents being married, but being more friends and not really showing affection and all those things. She didn't want, you know, just to be essentially roommates with children and with responsibilities together, but, you know, seemingly not really loving each other. She talked about how she doesn't know why she decided to operate this way in this fight, but she decided that I'm not going to fight with you. We're going to have a conversation. We love each other. Let's act like it. And he didn't know what to do with that. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. Exactly. Like when they're telling me the story, I'm like, whoa. And she's like, yeah, you know, I I don't know why I did that because like my folks didn't do that because they, they, you know, they, they didn't have a relationship. So it would have just been like, you know, we're both, they're both fighting and then somebody just quits and like, that's just what it is. And you move forward and you act like it didn't happen. And that's, you know, but when she did that, he now was in a position to have to make a decision. Do I continue to like fight to essentially try to make you fight? (laughs) Or do I, you know, stop and realize that the way that I learned may not be the right way. It may not be his way. And instead of me continuing to go down that path of wrong, she she said this, most of the time it's a pride issue, especially for us men, it's a pride issue. And that pride has been built up since we were kids. You're a man. Take pride in your work. Take pride in what you do. Don't show weakness. You 
man up and you five. There's so much of that that we don't realize how much we actually take into our relationships. That's not something that you just turn off. And so you have how you grew up and that experience and what you saw and experienced with your parents and whether or not they showed affection and whether or not they had conversations and whether or not they they put their relationship first, which oftentimes I know for us, for me, I didn't see that. I didn't see putting relationship first. I didn't see affection. I, I didn't see any of those things. But then you see the superficial, you know, fairy tale stuff in your Disney and in your shows and your movies. So then you're like, I want that. And part of even the deep desire for that is because you lack the truth over here. So then you see the opposite extreme. You're like, oh, I want that. But the only tools you have is the tools that you've been taught. And you put those into use and you don't get this outcome. And then it's like, oh, shoot, now what? And oftentimes we just continue to, you know, try to break that down with force when the answer the whole time is love. What say ye? <laughs> <laughs> you and this what say ye. So the first thing that actually popped up as you were talking is I saw this clip and this psychologist researcher was speaking about the two crises that boys have or men have in life, one being at five and one being at 15. Now, I didn't finish the video to hear about what happens when you're 15, but I did listen to the part about what happens when you're five. So when you said you need to man up when you're five, I was like, that's exactly what boys go through is that when you turn five or around that age, you are told that your ability or you showing emotion differs now from how a girl shows emotion. And even though prior to five, boys tend to be a bit more emotionally charged than girls do, and at least or show it more, five is the age where it starts to shift. And his idea was that it's because at that age, boys usually start school and there's more public shame surrounding the idea of boys being too emotional or too quote unquote feminine. And they are met with these expectations that you don't operate or act out of fear and you don't operate or act out of emotion, period. So that age, that man up when you're five is a very real thing. Some of his description of why and all that kind of stuff, the, the school stuff, I think made sense. But I think that a lot of that leans on if you don't spend a lot of time with your children, if you allow their exposure to outside sources, whether that be at school, teachers, other kids, being he more heavy than your interaction with them, which is why I, I even think so many people now are leaning towards like the homeschool route and just making time with their children more impactful and intentional. I think now men who are fathers, who are millennial fathers, spend way more time with their children on average than our, gen our parents' generation did. And I think that shows just how much we, our generation, was exposed to things outside of our parents that we realized, hey, when I become a parent, like, I don't want to be like that. I want to spend time with my kids. I want to actually be involved. I want to be the dad that's there. I want to be the dad that's having the conversations. I want to be the dad that is present, right? And so I think that it's very interesting that we're having even this conversation because I think about our sons. And I think about the type of father that you are to them and the way that you are a husband to me and how you really do make it a point to show affection to me in front of them. Like to somebody else or other people, maybe that feels a little bit too intentional, but for us, it's on purpose because oh, yeah. we want our children to know that mommy and daddy didn't just, 
you know, have them and create a home for us, but they loved each other and they showed it. And this is an example for what you should desire when you grow up and to know, um, this reminds me of what we read the other day about children should grow up knowing and being excited about the fact that for one person, they are going to be seen as attractive and they are going to be romantically wanted and desired by that one person, whoever they're created for and whoever, like me as a woman, whoever I am meant for, I'm the rib for, they should grow up expecting that. They should grow up expecting to be sought after by this one person who loves them and adores them and just can't get enough of them. Not this concept of what do I need to look like to be desirable? What do I need to act like to be attractive? How should I dress in order for people to think that I'm pretty? All of those things. Which is all drawn from a majority, not from you being uniquely who God created you to be. Right. And so we talk about that, like, oh, you know, be you from the very surface part of those things, not realizing that like, by me trying to look and follow the majority, I am doing the opposite of what would need to be done for me to be unique and walk in everything you can't that God has really created. Really, do be. both. You cannot. You can't. Do both. Yeah, you can't. It's look impossible. around. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you can't follow trends and also walk your own path. You can't do that because you only have a set amount of energy and focus to spend. So if your focus and spend is over here on what's trendy and what's popular right now, what everybody else is doing, then you are neglecting this very specific and very unique call for you as a person. And It's funny, actually. So we were watching a show the other day, a dating show. What I noticed was a lot of the women are very trendy. They are dressing the way that you expect them to dress as being like hot, young and single. Maybe not young, but hot and (laughs) single. Okay. Um, Because this is not a young crowd. It's like a crowd of like 30s, 40s um, singles and looking for love. And the women that have just, you know, the wigs that are popular right now and the makeup that looks super spot on and just all those things, they are struggling in the show to find true connection and companionship while this one other woman who isn't as trendy as them, who may not be as quote unquote beautiful to like the societal standard, who also has two children at home and is very forthcoming about the fact that she has two children that are very much so part of her package. And she's looking for a husband that's going to be able to not just be a husband, but also a leader of their home and a father to her children. She has multiple connections. She has multiple men singling her out and saying, that's a good woman. Her kind heartedness. She's got this nurturing sense about her. She feels solid. She feels safe. And she's soft. And it's like, how many of us as women try to look a certain way, act a certain way, thinking that that's what men want, thinking that whoever my husband is, this is what he's going to want. When in all actuality, you are doing the very thing that is going to have him miss you because you're, you're not actually exhibiting who you are internally and uniquely. And so you may attract some men, but they're not the man that's supposed to be attracted to you because he can't see past all this stuff on you to see who you really are. And I think that some people can say there's a balance, and I think that there is a balance, but the balance has to heavily lean towards you being and on a journey towards being more of who God created you to be. Yeah, and men are the same way. Uh, like. In all the ways, like men are, it's kind of wild that there is, it's starting to like not be a difference where you can't really tell them apart because you have both sides that are, um, 
whatever they consider to be a good man or a good woman, literally as broad as that can possibly be, it's like, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to have the gym routine. I'm going to have the business. I'm going to have the brands. I'm going to have the car. I'm going to have the house. And when all of those things are set, now I'm ready for a woman. And that's not the way it works. That hasn't worked. I don't think we realize how far we go into a thing and how much it's going to literally affect everything else. Mm -hmm. So by the time I get all of these things and what it's taking taken me and who I've had to become to get there, nowhere on that journey was my wife. So now I'm looking for someone that fits this thing in my head that I've created. It has nothing to do with my purpose, has nothing to do with her. Because then then on the other side, she's trying to fit the type of woman that those guys normally attract. It's almost like <laughs> going to a website with all these clothes and then going through the filters and you're clicking all these filters and then it's giving you, you know, 20 options out of the 2000. And it's like, okay, based on your filters, this is what you have to work with. Huh? Right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, literally so not the way you're supposed to find your person at all it's not a individual road you do the things you want to do or you feel led to do whatever okay you want this career you want this sort of uh, financial stability and then when you have those things the woman will just fit into whatever that's not how it's supposed to be it's supposed to be you are who you are and, and as a you person for that per for you. Exactly. Regardless of these tangible physical things that you acquire along the way. Because what that woman is supposed to do is come into your life and expand everything that you desire that is on you to do in, in life. So that's why for men, it's so important for you to have a focus and a purpose in mind that is from God, because whatever you do, whether it's for God or not, the woman that you bring into your life as your rib, as your wife will expand. So if you are focused on the career, the cars, the financial goals and all of those things, you're going to attract a woman who is also focused on physical things. She wants the bags. She wants the beauty maintenance weekly, okay? The expensive treatments, the surgeries, the those are the things that she will desire because that's what you've established is what your life is. So if she wants those things too, she's going to expand on those things and that's why she's even attracted to you is because that's what you're setting the tone as. Flip that. And you say, yeah, I am passionate about my career. I'm passionate about the goals that I have for my life. But at the end of the day, I want a woman to know that I love her more than all this stuff. I want to build a family that at the end of the day, yes, I'm working to get all these things, but it's also that my family can be able to have a comfortable lifestyle so that we can all be who we've been called to be and we can establish ourselves as, you know, uh, a family that strives after what we're supposed to strive after, but also we care about the things that don't cost anything. We care about love. We care about compassion. We care about the things that are not tangible. And so if you establish those things as the man, you say, yeah, I can, we can go to on a trip to Mexico and stay at the best places and do all the things but if the alternative is we're fighting the whole time or the alternative is well if i got to work 100 hours i got to work 100 hours that. yes then what is really the point because i'm trying to afford extravagant vacations so that i can escape my current reality so you are working your tail off all this time all these days missing out on life so that you could have one moment of quote unquote bliss that is very temporary. It's putting a it's putting a five hundred dollar t shirt on filth. Because what? Like it's 
it's the appearance on the from far away. It's the appearance that like, oh, that's glittering. Mm-hmm. But then you get close enough to it, and there's a stench. Yep. That is happening. That is rotten from the inside out. Yep. And so, so to come out of that, because that was me. That was me. Like, I remember thinking, like, for number one, I have to work, 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 because that's what I saw. Like, I saw men who worked, who hustled, who grinded by any means necessary. That was the number one thing. Over marriages, over, over you know, being fathers, it was like, I got to get to the back. That was the number one thing. So... I grew up that way. I started to operate in that. And I always say, and well, <laughs> and to add to that, not having my biological father in my life, there was also that void where I'm like, I'm thinking that he's the scum of the earth, so I can't be like him. So I desire kids because I see all the fairy tale stuff and I'm watching all the kids' movies that got the white picket fence and all of these things. So I know that I'm going to be a husband. I know that I'm going to be a father. However, I don't want to be, I have a click down. I don't want to be like my dad. And anything that you try not to be, you become. It cannot be, I don't want to be like them, so I'm going to do this. You just end up on the same destination. You just took a different route. And here's the thing. When you're a child, you can't help but come to that conclusion because your frame of reference and exposure is so limited that that seems like as a child, your only way of understanding and coping and moving on. So yeah, when you're young, you're a kid. Which is why it's so important to see the right way at a young age because you were designed to like get that and then that sticks. Yeah. Not to get to a place to where I've seen the wrong thing and now I have to like try to control alt delete that so that I can actually do something different and put something new there. Or it be my responsibility as a child to find something else. Which we do, because I did that too. Like I started to look for all of these different traits that I thought was the way to this dream in my head. I tried to look for that in other men, which, you know, I would get it sometimes, but it would also come with other things that I wasn't supposed to be getting to. So you have all this responsibility, this weight that is on you, and that would culminate into me bringing all of that in with you. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. With all that being said, this is why healing is so important. You can come into marriage with all of that. You can be in relationships with all of that. But at any point that you realize that, oh, wow, I've been building my life based off of a childish perspective. And I'm not saying childish in a negative way. I'm literally saying childish perspective. And childish is actually a good thing because right. that implies that you are teachable. And, and. Leadable. Right. That's a word too. Yet at the same time, <laughs> naive. We are supposed to be naive to naive. things. Yeah. Yes, but when we are still thinking with a childlike mind, an unhealed, a hurt child mindset as an adult, that's where we not only cause issues for ourselves, we cause issue for other people. So a lot of, I think, issues in marriages, especially like young marriages, are I still have this trauma in me this mentality in me that i gotta go get it this is the way i'm supposed to be a man this is the way i'm supposed to be a husband when there was no room for me to actually grow into this role or actually take into account what my actual wife contributes to me and what my role means because that's the other piece is like you grow up having this mindset that i'm not going to be like them so i'm going to go do this instead That has nothing to do with the other person that's involved because you 
haven't met them for most of the time that you're building up this idea of who you going to be in marriage or as a dad or as a mom, you don't even know the other counterpart to you yet. And then when you meet them, you expect them to just accept this mentality and this story that you've built for yourself, not realizing that they've done the exact same thing for the same amount of time for years and years and years, they've had a mentality and an idea of who they were going to be in marriage and what they were going to do and what they weren't going to do and all of those things. And when we marry people and we have these very strong beliefs and these very strong ideas of what our marriage is supposed to be, and then we get married and then they clash, people think, well, we're not supposed to be married. And our counter to that is maybe you are. It's just that those two ideologies that you grew up with based off of a means to cope with an uncomfortable, maybe feeling abandoned or feeling, you know, hurt, pain, whatever it is from your childhood, those mentalities and those ideas that you built up and supported and believed all these years are finally coming to an end. So there is a death happening. There is a sense of time's up. And now how do you move on if that's not part of who you are or how you operate? And I think that is what's really happening for a lot of people. I think that's what happened with us was that when we would start having these fights all the time, it was like our two ideologies of what marriage was supposed to be were clashing because they were both wrong. My mind goes here. It's been going here for a while, actually, um, for months. So in the in the time at the time that we're filming this, it's only right that this would come up. John three. Can I read some scripture? Is that okay. Of course, it is. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And actually, I want to go into a different, I want to go into where I have the strongs because I think that there will be something that is really cool. Okay, wow. So one really cool thing with the strongs that I love is that I say when you're reading the Bible and there's a name, that name is there for a reason. If there's not a name, then that there's not a name for a reason. So put your name there. But if there's a name, if you look up that name, there's a reason why that name is there. Nicodemus means conqueror. So not only was he very smart, very knowledgeable, like extreme, he was a lawyer of the Pharisees, very studious, you know, know it all, got all the degrees, the whole not on top of that, he was a conqueror. Who doesn't want a man that's really smart and can fight? <laughs> like, everybody wants that. Like, yeah. that, that's the thing, right? Yeah. But the thing about that combination is you can't be those things without pride. Nope. So, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, we being the rest of the Pharisees, all the smart men. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And be born? Jesus answered, Very verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He just told one of the smartest, most respected men there 
he just gave him something that he couldn't solve or that he could not make sense of. Just as a little snippet of what he's trying to get him to understand. I read that because most men aim to be a Nicodemus. We want to have all the accolades. We are trained to be the smartest, to be the most powerful conqueror in the room. But in order to be who God has called us to be, we cannot be, we have to be the opposite of that. So it's very hard for us to humble ourselves because we've been built in pride for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So the way you get back to even in marriage, back to where you were always supposed to be, be born again. Forget what I thought I knew. Humble myself. I don't know. Now, God, can you show me? Not bringing in everything that I've been taught, not the way my daddy did it and what my mama said and all these different things. That has to go. That's not to say that there won't be times after the fact as you're growing that you don't remember something that happened to put to what God has shown you. But my foundation can't be that. They weren't privy to baptism during this time. That's what I was also going to ask you. Yeah, John the Baptist was the first to bring that forward. The Essenes were doing baptisms, but this wasn't something that was popular amongst the the Jews. Temple, yeah. So when John the Baptist is doing this, they would come to like even Pharisees. So if he's the one of the leaders of the Pharisees, he either went to see for himself. Or people were coming back to bring word to him of the interactions with John, who was doing this baptizing. So he's like, you know, check that there. But also spiritually, being born again means now I am learning from here on out of his spirit. Yeah. We are born pure. But most of us didn't grow up with parents operating in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're taught first, that's what you are holding on to. Mm -hmm. That is your Bible. Then when you grow up and you start to hear different things and understand different things, you can't just grasp onto that stuff because now you are mixing clean water with a dirty cup, which will contaminate the clean water. So you have to be born again, which is what he is saying, which is is, is, um, 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 shown by me getting baptized now is showing that I'm under a new covenant and I'm doing things a different way than what I used to do before. However, people stop there. They don't realize that physically I have to start to renew my mind. Mm. I have to literally forget what I thought I knew so that then there's space for me to be led by the spirit, not to just forget. And then there'd be this just empty void. I need to fill that with spiritual things. What you're saying is very true, is that as a babe, you are going to have to start from scratch and be learning how to walk, talk, eat everything from the Heavenly Father, from Christ, too. that That is beautiful. That is the journey that he wants us on. So in verse 6, he says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Prior to our latest walk, we were born of flesh. Even to even to bring us all the way back full circle, when the gentleman is like, yeah, I, I learned this way, and this is how I grew up, and this is what was in my home. And I was stern in that. He didn't even realize, or, or I don't think he did, the spiritual implications of him receiving that love from his fiance, then stopping and changing course. In order to do that, There has to be a humbling because that is me forsaking what I thought I knew. Mm -hmm. That is me admitting, yeah, that that I learned wasn't the way. Right. And also, perfect love cast out fear. The love that she showed to him even made it comfortable for this man to take off his armor, put down his weapon, his strategy. I feel like every everybody tries to give a man the, um, um, what is it, Man of War book? Is it called Man of War? Art of, War. Book, huh? Art, Art of War. Art of War. I feel like it, there's like these like three or four books that I feel like every man tries to give other men. And it's just continuing to hamper us because when, when the rubber meets the road, if we really want to experience marriage the way God always intended for us to experience it, 
We have to put all that stuff down. All of it. And you know what's interesting? There's also a lot of conversation and narrative that marriage is a battle. And yeah, that you not. have to come in ready to defend and to fight and all of those things. And the thing is, though, when you hear that out of order, when you hear that out of context, you think that going into marriage means a fight within it when it's actually your marriage is the weapon against the fight outside of it. Yep. So how do you shift your perspective in knowing that I'm not supposed to be fighting you? I'm that's not what, supposed to be fighting that's you. What, that's what she, she literally said in those words. She was like, I don't know what came over me, but I just knew I'm not supposed to be fighting you. Like, that's not what this is supposed to be about. And we get so confused because we see all these other people having marital issues or talking about how hard marriage oh, is and talking about it, how. Like, the war on marriage ain't just like, again, we really tend to think that we, the depiction of Satan that Hollywood has shown us that he's running around in a red suit with a pitchfork and a tail. We really assume that, not realizing that the war on marriage is in shows. It's in showing these dysfunctional shows. It's in showing these marital therapy sessions. It's in showing just all of of the 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 lukewarmness that is shown pertaining to marriage is warfare. Because you are people like, uh, I can do better single. I don't want that. No, it's not terrible, but I can be happier over here. I can be happier with the same sex. I, and it's like, that's not what God created marriage to be. But that's what you see so much in the media. And even when there are podcasts and, and shows and all this stuff, there's so much dysfunction in the realm of marriage that the ones that do get the screen time are ones that you're like, Shh, they ain't gonna make it because they don't even like each other. I mean, and they don't even. They're supposed to get a screen time because we live in a wicked construct. Right. So, like, they will to get To your point, time. That, yeah. that the war on marriage is not between husband and wife. The war on marriage is everything outside of it showing you and telling you that it ain't worth it, showing you and telling you that you're gonna be happier by yourself, showing you and right. telling you that operating in love within a marriage with an imperfect person ain't worth it when which means that is only making stronger all these feelings i grew up with all the examples that i've seen yep that's just making that stronger that is feeding flesh so christ says that which is born of spirit is spirit be born again that way Everything that goes in you is of my spirit, and then you're a spirit. But as long as you try to put a a God T-shirt over filthiness, it's not gonna work. No matter what what you do, no matter how much therapy, no matter, it's not going to work because we've been fashioned, we've been taught to be. Other than our father. So he's saying we can't. Nah, y'all. Be born again. Like Nicodemus talking about miracles and who we know. He's like, you you can't even. Fat, like the what we experienced in our marriage. When I was the old me, I couldn't have fathomed this. This is better <laughs> than the best view that I had of marriage then. If I would have had the fairy tale that I thought it was then, this is even better than that. I could not have this without being born again, without being led of his spirit. It is impossible. It's like this. There are a lot of people standing on the sideline, standing outside the stadium with a God t-shirt on while there is <laughs> all the merch. All the merch. While there is a whole game going on inside that stadium with players on the field with God jerseys on and Satan jerseys on. And you don't even understand that the barrier between you going from 
outside the stadium to end the game is a choice. God wants you in the game, not just sporting the team, but actually playing for the team. Because what you really don't understand is when you put in that God t-shirt on top of filth, it means you might be wearing team God, but you actually are following and honoring and living for, playing for the other team. Funny story to go to that. So I was watching the pregame for college football for something a few weeks ago, right? There was a guy that they put the camera on that just brought porn mayo all over himself. <laughs> what? Like, I'm talking about, I guess he told the producer, I'm going to do this. It was like one of the live pregame shows. I guess he told the producer, I'm going to do this. Put the camera on me. Let me know. And as soon as they did it, he had two guys just pour mayo. He was, he was naked, no shirt on, pour mayo all over him. I was like, <laughs> why would somebody do that? And then it hit me when you just made that analogy, which was incredible, by the way. The people that are in the game, no one that's playing in that football game would do that. Nope. They wouldn't even think about doing that. Oftentimes, the radical fans have very little in common with those actually playing the game. (laughs) Very little. It's the reason why you're not playing the game. There are people who are fast, who do all the, and they still don't play the game because there's something, there's a different level of commitment. There's a different level of discipline. There's a different level of buy in. There's a different lifestyle that you have to live. So those who are actually doing marriage the way God created marriage to be done versus those who are just wearing the T-shirts. Going to the game. Just going to the game. Guess what? And at any moment can change teams. It's different. So get in the game. Get in the game. Get in the game. Because also the game, the people playing the game didn't make the rules. You are submitted. You following a play. You're submitted to what the coaches and the owners and all. You're submitted. And all you worried about, they'll say, hey, like you asked me about it. I'm just doing my job. I'm doing, I'm just obeying what my father said. He's giving me every. He's giving me the speed. The, the he's giving me everything I need. All I gotta do is actually obey. All the other stuff, I ain't gotta worry. I don't even have the time to put mail on me and then clean it off. <laughs> right. <laughs> to to ask the people around me, hey, can you hold this mail? And when the camera come over here, I need you to make sure that the mail hits me in my face. And continue until the mayo is empty, like to even do all of that. What else could you have done? Get in the game. Get in the game. Run the play, a.k.a. be obedient to our father. Okay, time running out. (laughs) We got to go. It's probably going to shut us off at any minute. But yeah, y'all, I'm another banger. You going to say that on every episode or what? Probably just another banger. Um, Five, five. All yeah. right. We love y'all. Thank we y'all for y'all. tuning in. Yes. We'll see y'all in the next one. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the God Bolt Life podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us a DM or leave us a review wherever you're listening. We really appreciate having you with us on this journey.